thanks everyone for coming this morning and thank you for everyone on the live stream and who decided to stay in bed and perhaps watch it later. I want to start first by setting the scene for our story today. It's a Wednesday morning, which is the day that I normally set aside for work on OpenStreetMap. I get up, I have my breakfast, I put on an OpenStreetMap t-shirt, and I head to my desk to do a day of development work. But before I get started, I have a quick check on our GitHub repository to see whether anyone has submitted a pull request for codes that they want to be merged in. So I have a quick check. Oh, well, there's quite a few pull requests waiting. In fact, there's another page. Oh, oh. Last week, there were 93 pull requests waiting on review. Over 500 issues needs dealing with. And that raises the question, where do I even start? So I'm one of the two volunteer maintainers for OpenStreetMap website. And today I want to give you some background on the project, some of the key challenges that we face, and then go into some details about what exactly is a maintainer. Some of you will know all this background, but there's always new people. So to get started, the OpenStreetMap website project uh, can be traced back to 2006, when Steve Coast started uh, work on this. But the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice 2006 was not the start of the project. The first version of OpenStreetMap was actually a Java application that was then rewritten into pure Ruby and in 2006 converted to work on Rails. And sometimes you'll hear us talking about the Rails port, even though it's 17 years since that happened, we still use that name from time to time. It contains three parts. The first part is the code that runs the OpenStreetMap website. That seems obvious from the name of the project. But it also contains the XML and JSON APIs, which is what your editors use when you press save to add the data into OpenStreetMap. And the third part of the project is it controls the core database, what features we want to store in OpenStreetMap, how that's all laid out. So all of these three parts are all part of the project that I'll be talking about today. Lots of people will be familiar with some aspects of what goes on on the website, nodes, ways, relations, diary comments, change set comments, but there's actually many features that some of you will just never come across. Here's a list of our database models. And actually, when you look at the website, it can be slightly confusing because this is the front page of the website. But a lot of what you see here is not covered by this project. It's actually developed as independent projects by other groups of people. So for example, all the map layers are managed by other groups of people independently. The search functionality is powered by Nominatum. There are several routing engines, all of which are separate from this project. Even the built-in ID editor, again, has a different team of people managing it. And other tools like the query tool are powered by things like Overpass API. So although we have OpenStreetMap website project at the core, there are these user-facing external projects which are integrated. And we also have some behind the scenes projects like CGI Map, which accelerates some of the um, API calls, the various planet dump and data replication uh, scripts, which talk directly to the database to publish the data you see on planet.openstreetmap.org. And again, these are all independently managed. But the shape of OpenStreetMap website project, the codes that we choose to implement or that we don't implement is shaped in cooperation with all these external projects. As well as the features of the website that I'm sure you're all familiar with, there are several features which are only available for certain groups of people. And these are our site moderators and our site administrators. Now, it's worth pointing out, I'm not either an administrator or a moderator. I write the code that makes this happen, but it's other teams of people who have access to these features. So if you're a moderator, you get extra menu item. One of these is issues. Anytime you report some spam or a user whose uh, behavior needs to be investigated, these reports get collected together and made into issues. And our moderators have got a behind the scenes interface 
where they can manage uh, all the requests. These are just dummy ones because I've never seen the live production version of it. Uh, so this is just from my laptop. They can read the reports that people have been put in and they can decide what actions need to be taken, for example, hiding uh, diary entries. Moderators are also responsible for creating user blocks. Um, this is how we prevent people from using the API. So again, they have their own uh, interfaces for doing this. Administrators are one step further. Uh, they get to see uh, private information about user accounts and they can use this for helping spam fighting. And they also have a bulk interface API, which they can use if there's lots of accounts that they need to deal with at the same time. For example, uh, deleting multiple uh, spam signups. So that gives an idea of the breadth of the project and how many different features there are involved in it. And I want to cover what it looks like from an activity point of view. So in the 17 years, we've had over 13,000 commits to the repository. We've had more than 250 different people contributing. And we've got about one and a half thousand tests for all the different bits of the functionality of the website. In the last 12 months, we've had more than 900 commits. We've had 23 different contributors. And although we had that backlog that we talk about at the start of the presentation, we have dealt with more than 300 pull requests to add features, functionality, fix bugs, and so on. These are some of my personal highlights from the last 12 months, uh, including we upgraded to the latest version of the Rails framework, did some uh, upgrades to the Bootstrap framework, lots of focus on developer experience, making it easier for people to get started with the project. Um, and internationalization as well. And I'm going to touch on a few of these later on in the talk. So what's the key challenge for the project, for, for this development project? Well, like many of the OpenStreetMap projects, we are an extremely small team. We don't have an office full of full-time developers. We don't have significant resources behind it. We have two volunteer maintainers and uh, other developers who uh, work on uh, specific things. But what this means is that we need to choose carefully how we're going to develop the site. Uh, we don't have the capacity to write tens of thousands of lines of code. Uh, so the key strategy here is that we build on top of the work of other people um, by using various open source um, frameworks and libraries. So one example is the main framework that we use, we mentioned it already, uh, Ruby on Rails, used by sites like GitHub, it's used by Shopify, which powers a big chunk of uh, the world's online commerce, um, and we use it too. And this gives us lots of features out of the box that we wouldn't have the capacity to implement. Uh, and by staying up to date with the framework, we get all these for, for free. And I think it's worth looking at or, or considering how many developers there are who work on Rails. And there's hundreds of them from hundreds of different companies. And so we can build on top of all that work. So even though we're a small team, we're getting all that development work for free. And in fact, it's not just Rails. We use more than 200 different Ruby gems. We benefit from all the updates that go into Ruby, the new versions of Postgres. Uh, the node packages that we use for parts of the site and, and other libraries. So when you consider how much development effort goes on in addition, that does mean that we get a lot of stuff done f using not very many people. Another example is style sheets. This looks like a fairly basic website, but when you look at the tabs across the top, there are drop down menus, there are disabled input fields, there are what to do with the input field when an error has been made, how big should the gap between the labels and the inputs be, and just how round should the rounded corners be. These are far too many decisions for us to debate ourselves. And so we use the Bootstrap uh, CSS framework. And over the last few years, we've been migrating more and more of our style sheets to use this. And again, we get things like the new color mode support for doing dark mode will be something out of the box that we don't have to design. And in fact, it's our custom CSS that we used to use that's preventing us from using the color modes at the moment. So when we get rid of the, some more custom CSS, we'll get this by default. And the final example is slightly closer to home. 
the OpenStreetMap Map Foundation wanted to have a list of local chapters up, and it seems we can just write a list of local chapters, but then we'd need to maintain the list. We'd need to translate these, these uh, chapter names into more than the 100 languages that we support. And this work has already been done by other people in the uh, OpenStreetMap Community Index project. So although it was more work to set up uh, initially, we took that external project, we incorporated it into the website, and now whenever any changes, updates, fixes are made to local chapters, we get it um, automatically included. And in future, we can build on top of this uh, to add more local mailing lists or telegram groups or things like that, we could surface this information in the website too. So the, what is the role of a maintainer? More specifically, what's the difference between a volunteer developer and a volunteer maintainer? We use GitHub and many of you will be familiar with it. On GitHub, everyone, without having to be approved, can create issues, they can comment on issues, it can create pull requests, it can comment on pull requests, and they can review other people's pull requests. And the only thing that they can't do is merge the pull requests. But trust me, pressing the merge button is the easy bit of the process. I can, I can click that button all day long, it's not very hard. In reality, it's not the permissions that's the limiting factor, it's the choice of what the other developers want to do. So most developers only get down to around stage three, maybe stage four on this. They're focused on their own feature, they'll create a pull request, and then that's the limit of their involvement in the project. And I want today to encourage as many people as possible to think beyond that, to think to the next stage. So instead of just being focused on your own pull request, is to expand your involvement in the project to cover um, a, a kind of project-wide thinking. What are other people interested in? And how can you help the project um, in a long term achieve its long term goals? When I sit down, you can see there's an overwhelming amount of work that needs to be done. So there needs to be some kind of prioritization. And this is my own personal prioritization. So the first thing that I will always focus on is any security issues. We don't get many, maybe two or three a year where there's something, some serious security issue that we need to work on. And obviously that comes straight to the top of the pile. The next one is a slightly surprising perhaps, is the pull requests that I've made to other projects. Sometimes we're blocked by features on our dependencies or bugs that we've run into. And it can take a long time, maybe six weeks, eight weeks for these to get resolved because we're stealing, I'm a volunteer only working sometimes and the other projects are volunteers only working sometimes as well. Um, so I like to check in on the pull requests that I've made to see whether they can be nudged along or if anything needs to be changed. And so I do that fairly early on in the day. Next, I have a look to see if there are any important or urgent PRs that have come in. At the moment, this is definitely vandalism related. We've had um, previous people talking about it as well. So this is the kind of thing which comes up to the top of the, the priority list. After that, I'll look at any small pull requests. I only have a limited amount of time each day. And if I can review a pull request and it takes more than an hour, then this is very hard for me to slot in. So small pull requests where I can merge and get small amounts of functionality, those are next to my priority list. The large and the tricky PRs, sometimes I will just ask for them to be rethought and, and split up into smaller chunks, um, but they just inherently get delayed. And then the final thing is each day that I work on OpenStreetMap, I like to set aside an hour or two for my own personal priorities. And this is because up until that point in the day, all my work has been driven by other people's priorities. And those are not necessarily aligned with the long-term goals of the project. And so I, I carve aside this time to make sure that we are heading in the right direction. And so that's why at the end of the day, there's usually a little flurry of pull requests from me coming in or sometimes the following morning if I haven't quite finished it off. We talk a lot about reviews, and this is currently the limiting factor in the project, and it's definitely limiting how quickly we can uh, get things done. So it's worth going through some of the details as to 
what I do when I'm uh, reviewing a pull request. So the first thing is, does the continuous integration, do the automatic tests pass? And if they don't pass, then that's a hard no. We can't accept uh, pull requests that don't pass the test. And so it's imperative that the developer who has submitted the pull request as quickly as possible figures out what the problem is and sorts them out. Then I'll read the code and think, is it straightforward? Is it understandable? We're going to be working on this project for many years to come, and we can't accumulate lots of complicated or hard to understand things. Does it meet the larger project goals? With the best will in the world, there's an infinite number of features that we could add to the project. Um, some of which will only benefit one or two people. So we need to make sure that it's always uh, heading in the right direction. If it passes that initial review, I'll pull the code down locally. I'll test it out, especially the user interface. These are very hard to tell from the code whether it works or not. I'll try the alternative solutions, and then I'll ask for any changes. And if all this is successful, then the button gets clicked, the PR gets merged. But if it's not successful, this is where it gets tricky. Either I need to make some review comments, or in certain cases, I need to decline the pull request entirely. And I'm very acutely aware of what impact this can have on the developers involved. It's very hard to communicate over the internet in uh, this way. You can't see how your comments are being received. You can't see whether they understand or are sympathetic. And I have a lot of self-doubt about this process. <laughs> Am I being too critical? Is this their first ever contribution? How are they going to feel if I say no? And if I do say no, maybe this will be their last contribution. That's definitely not what I'm looking for. And also, what will the future maintainers think? Because they're going to look back at the things that I've accepted or declined and think, did he do the right thing or not? So given the unlimited amount of work, the technical difficulty involved, the emotions that come into doing this. The question is, why do I do it? Well, this code base is a critical part of OpenStreetMap. It doesn't take much imagination to think, if we didn't have the website, the API, or the database, how would OpenStreetMap cope? So I can't think of anything more critical that I could work on. Help is definitely needed. We are a long way behind where we would like to be. Uh, there are so many things that we could add that make the life of mappers easier, that make the life of the data working group easier. Um, there is scope for a lot of things to be done here. And I can help. I've, over the years, picked up enough skills, uh, picked up enough knowledge of OpenStreetMap where I can make a difference to this project. And so you add these three things together, and that's why I get involved. But I'm not a professional software engineer. I'm not being paid to do this. I'm a volunteer like many other people. And so if I can help, you guys can help too. So what can you do? Well, if you're a developer of any kind with any level of experience, please read our contributing file. It has lots of handy tips. Please do make new pull requests. We can see we merged over 300 a year. The chances of your pull request being successful are as high. Please help review the existing pull requests. If it's only Tom and I who do the reviews, there's a limit as to how much stuff we can get done. Other people can spot mistakes and get all these sorted before we look at the code, and that makes our reviews much easier. Think about improving the developer experience. If this is your first time, you're going to run into problems just trying to set up your development environment. Please tell us. Let us know. We can sort this out and make it easier for everyone to get involved. And if you're not a developer, we have over 100 incomplete translations. You can help your local community by ensuring everything is translated. And you can also help on the issue triage. With over 500 issues, I can't remember which ones are duplicates of which other ones, which ones we've seen before. If something is unclear and you don't understand it, then you can ask the uh, other people to clarify the issues. This is all super valuable stuff. But the biggest thing I hope is that there's a few people in the audience who are interested in doing all of this. And please come and join us. Join the team, become a maintainer. It would be super to have you. That's everything. Thanks very much. Yeah, interesting to see what's going on behind the scenes. I didn't even realize there was a moderation interface, but it makes sense that, that OpenStreetMap would have one. Does anyone have questions?
Yes. As a developer who doesn't know Ruby or Rails, what can I do to help? So there's a huge amount of stuff. The, the Ruby on Rails part of it is only a small part of the code base, and it's only a small part of the problem as well. So we have user interface issues. Um, the moderation panel, for example, is a terrible interface. It doesn't have the buttons where the buttons need to be. The layout is really bad. If you know HTML or CSS, you can help. If you know anything to do with databases, you can help. Uh, we have um, features that we want to implement that will need to be involving migrations. And I know that you yourself, Paul, you're experienced with things like databases and, and working with data on the huge scale that we have on, on OpenStreetMap. So you can definitely help with those kinds of things. Uh, Andy, thank you for the talk. Um, there was one point that you mentioned there. Does the PR fit into our strategy concept, how the, uh, what the website should do? And I think that is sometimes a bone of contention because it's not completely clear what that actually is? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think perhaps that needs uh, additional clarification. So there's um, the larger project goals for OpenStreetMap. What does OpenStreetMap want to do? What does OpenStreetMap want its um, own, own things to do? Um, some of the talk about the larger project goals is still, like for the moment, we have our QA tools separately. Um, and so having that knowledge as to what should be in the website and what shouldn't be in the website. But then there's also just the technical things on, we want to reduce the codes that we manage and that fits in with the larger project goals as well. So if somebody comes along and makes a pull request with a hundred lines to implement something, then that might not be uh, work we want to maintain. And that's also a goal that it might not fit in with. Um, but yeah, if people have strong opinions on what they think the goals of the project should or should not be, then I'm really interested to hear from other people. Any more questions? Uh, so to be clear, how many developers are you seeking to have? How many like maintainers are you seeking to have? Like if I understand correctly, you have only you are the only maintainer. Two, okay, uh, and so um, so I, I guess for become to become maintainers, you have to get to like show that you have some skills and you uh, have been involved in some in the projects before. I think. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So the the key things about being a maintainer is obviously being able to to create the pull requests is, is a prerequisite. You need to have a certain level of development experience, but then it's mostly the mindset and to show that you understand um, all aspects of the, the project, both within the code base and also the wider OpenStreetMap. So for example, I started uh, contributing seriously in around 2016, um, and it took me around 65 pull requests and nine months of demonstrating this, and then I was offered uh, to be a maintainer. And since then, we've offered other people maintainer uh, as well. Um, some people have declined, but uh, that's the, you, you do need a certain amount of experience. But the best way to demonstrate the skills is to do these pull requests, because it lets me know that you're not only able to work on the features that interest you, but that you're also interested in doing other things. When it comes to numbers, my goal is to have about five maintainers. I'm not sure that it would be realistic for us to ask for 50, but 50 maintainers would be awesome. Uh, you mentioned that Ruby on Rails is not strictly necessary to contribute uh, as programmer. Is there a list of the issues that require HTML and CSS? I just quickly tried to find, and I was not really able to find uh, relevant ones. So I guess that others that could contribute also may have trouble. Yeah, I, I don't think I've tagged that many issues as CSS. A lot of the issues um, that are style sheet related are to do with implementing right to left languages properly, so Arabic, Hebrew, and other languages like that. Um, we. If you have skills in CSS, and especially if you understand 
the implications of setting text direction, HTML language direction, and how input forms should work uh, for other languages, then these things are, are useful. And they don't involve any Ruby. That's just changing our style sheets and changing the HTML. Yeah, and in some sense, we, we, you can help out by moving more of the functionality directly to Bootstrap. So we have um, a few thousand lines of custom style sheets, a lot of which duplicate stuff that's already in Bootstrap. So being able to um, edit that and remove the bits that we don't need, again, that involves zero Ruby. But Ruby is quite easy to learn. I learned it, you guys can learn it, it's not a problem. Um, and we don't use anything particularly complex. Most of the site is just, there's stuff in the database, we wanna make a page that shows the same information. The Ruby code to make that happen is, is minimal, there's really not very much. And you can learn an awful lot about how to make the website work by just looking at other examples of what works already um, to get an idea of how to implement your own ideas. Cool, thank you, Alan. All right, thanks very much.